Mine's right here. Uh, if I don't know you or you don't know me, I'm Sheila Oliveri. I meet early childhood literacy specialist. Thank you for coming out on this gloomy day. Of course, if you're all going to stay in the gloomy days, you wouldn't come out for three weeks. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, which I contemplated. But anyway, um, thanks for coming. And we're going to, I kind of wrote a basic agenda up here. We have a very special guest to share with us today. I'm very excited. I will just give you a little hint that this woman is my idol or mentor. So, for people who say to, to me, oh, Sheila, you know, you have such great ideas, blah, 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 I always think, well, I guess it started back there. So, I will keep you in suspense a little longer. But anyway, Mary, if you wouldn't mind, or actually, Edie, if you wouldn't mind, just tell everybody your name. Uh, I placed the, my handouts in the left-hand side. There are other papers along the back that if you haven't received them at other workshops or cafes, feel free to take and um, you can fill up the right side with that if you like. So the reason we're getting together today is to talk about integrating music, rhythm, and movement into your read aloud session. And I know that when I train new volunteers, they're overwhelmed by all the stuff I tell them they're going to want to do within 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, their heads are spinning. And, and while I realize that every single 30-minute session is not going to contain every single trick in your book, um, it's something that I just want you to think about occasionally putting in there to enhance the way the kids are getting information. Okay. Um, you know, people learn differently. And the many different ways that we can present literacy information to them, there's a chance that a kid who maybe wasn't getting it before, it will spark their curiosity and it will, it will hit home. Quick uh, anecdote from my own personal life. My three children all take after me and have weird learning habits, um, most often called learning disabilities, <laughs> and um, which I think is a terrible term. We're just creative thinkers. And um, my youngest son could not learn his phone number to save his life. And it was for some reason of utmost importance when he was in the four-year-old classroom at his preschool that he knew his, his phone number. Everybody else knew their phone number. I had to hear about it all the time. I don't know. So we tried, you know, looking at the numbers and, you know, all these different things. One day I said, how about this? Eight, six, three, five, four, eight, nine. Mm -hmm. Suddenly the kid knew his phone number. That kid is now, uh, an actor, singer, dancer in New York trying to make it on Broadway. Oh. That's how he learns. Mm -hmm. Stumbled upon it, but it made a difference in the rest of his learning career. So it's just another way of getting to kids and lighting that fire for them. Um, I'm going to quickly read through this. Music, movement, songs, and rhythms play an integral part in quality early childhood learning experiences setting a relaxed tone for developing the necessary skills and concepts leading to literacy. So what are those? Vocabulary, obviously we're all working on doing vocabulary, pumping up their vocabulary. Sound discrimination, also known as phonological sensitivity. Um, I like to think of the sound discrimination. Um, so even those nonsense songs that we think, well why do you even sing those? That's why, sound discrimination. Um, listening and thinking skills. Kids have to be able to not just read, they have to be able to comprehend. And at this point in their development, when every, they're taking everything in auditorily, they, if singing songs with them, they give them instructions on what to do, or things like that, they learn to think, they learn to process that information, and they learn to do the actions. That's um, listening and thinking skills or comprehension. So you think about how can I use, you know, how do we build vocabulary in songs? It's simple. Think about the Itsy Bitsy Spider. Every two-year-old can do the finger play and recite the words to the Itsy Bitsy Spider, but they're not really comprehending the story. They're, they could be eight, six, three, five, four, eight, one, eight, six, six, you know? So it's just when you, that's why I'm, I'm constantly saying to people, take in books of nursery rhymes and read it as a story without the song and then sing it. 
and then say, because if, if you do the finger play with kids, they'll say, when up the water spout, down came the rain. And then if you say, what's a water spout, little pond? They've never really even focused in on that word before. But if you pick out those words and talk about them and what they mean, every time after that that they do this, they will be seeing a play in their brain about a spider climbing up a gutter or a faucet or whatever you identify a water spout as. Um, if you have that um, Mother Goose sing along. Sing along. No, not not the sing along. Oh, Mother Goose <coughs> nursery rhymes. The nursery rhyme book that we were giving to everybody last year. Keep it in your bag and try to use at least one of those every day. The photographs are amazing. They show images that kids can relate to. I don't read all of them. I don't think you need to read all of them. I pick out the tried and true ones. You know the ones that that they can recall and, and recite later. Um, like with any kind of compilation, like I said, you're not going to like everything in there. Um, but that's a great way to enhance vocabulary. Um, change words in a familiar song. So instead of always singing, twinkle, twinkle, little star, because again, they're not necessarily thinking while they're doing that. It's a rote recitation. Twinkle, twinkle. They will say, little star, and you can say, gigantic star, and then they'll go, what was that? And then of course they'll be like, oh, I like that, I get to be loud and big, you know? Let them stand up. Don't do it just as a finger play, sitting down. Let them stand up and move, and show you how gigantic they can be, or twinkle, twinkle, running star, or anything like that. It doesn't have to be, and you know, the sillier it is, usually, the more they enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But it's a way for them to really connect with what the words are that you're saying and bring in new words. Gigantic. What is gigantic? Well, listen to my voice when I say it. Gigantic! Do you think it's little or big? Um, let's see. Make up your own songs using familiar tunes to teach concepts like opposites. We'll go through an opposite song um, on one of the other pages. Focusing on spatial vocabulary like Hey, little, little, the cow jumped over the moon. These are all things that not just twos, but threes, fours, and fives also need. And if you want to do some kind of little activity after doing it, you stand at one end of the room and say, you know, now I'm far away. And go on up and say, now I'm closer. Things like that. Think about how you can put these into action, not just recitation, but actually action. Um, you can use songs and rhymes to teach sound discrimination. Sing songs and rhymes that, fe that feature alliteration, onomatopoeia, <coughs> and rhyme. Do we all know onomatopoeia? Way back from high school. I love the word too. Um, so the wheels on the bus and the horn on the bus, those beep, 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 onomatopoeia. Uh, Down by the Bay, obviously a rhyming song. Uh, these are also on these pages behind. And songs, rhythm, and rhymes to teach listening and thinking skills. Do we all know a Ram Sam Sam? Mm -hmm. um, it's, again, kind of a nonsense song, but it's simple. Simple enough that even uh, threes can begin to learn it and over the course of your school year, with using it repetitively, they will be able to do it. They will probably either start singing it first without the hand motions, or they will focus on the hand motions and only begin singing later because their body is taking in the information and processing it one way first. But by the end of the year, everybody will be able to do it. So it goes like this. Uh, ram, Sam, Sam, uh, Ram, Sam, Sam. Gooly, 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 no, gooly, 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 Ram, Sam, Sam. Oh, Ravi, oh, Ravi. Gooly, 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 Ram, Sam, Sam. Does it have to be those exact movements? It can be anything you want. So again, it's sound discrimination, movement, which is engaging their brain and having them, challenging them to learn to do both at the same time. Um, do we do? Do we know who stole the cookie from the cookie jar? I actually like to say who took the cookie. I like to do who took the cookie from the cookie jar. Um, I, you know, it's, it's a simple thing. It's just maybe a chill thing. 
But um, so that is, does everybody know that one? Mm -hmm. I saw, in fact, the day that we went to, um, the day that Channel 5 filmed, the teachers were leading that when we walked into the room. And it was so great to see them singing and engaging the kids in singing. And the kids is kind of like a, it's a call and response almost. So if you look at the last page, um, it's at the bottom. So the teacher would start, who took the cookie from the cookie jar? And then, no, everybody would start, who took the cookie from the cookie jar? Carol took the cookie from the cookie jar. Who, who me? me? Yes, you. you. Not, not I. Not then who? Marilyn. <laughs> <laughs> Marilyn took the cookie from the cookie jar. So she would say Marilyn, and then we'd all join together. <coughs> Marilyn, Marilyn stole the cookie from, from the cookie, cookie jar. jar. And then Marilyn gets to say, me? Who me? Yes, who you. me? Then who? Judy. <laughs> So everybody gets a chance to do it, even those quiet, quiet, shy kids. I mean, I saw this in action last week um, at this filming. It was so great because, you know, there are some kids who just don't like to speak out in a group. You know, it's just too much for them. And yet, because this is such a playful song and everybody is taking part, they might not yell it out, but they will in their spot say, and you're getting them involved. You're making them feel like a part of the group, an active part of the group. They're no longer just sitting to the side not participating. So try to think of all of those different ways of, you know, it's just so important um, to be able to change up what you're doing. And it's really pretty easy to fit it in. So we move on to uh, the number three on my agenda, which is how. How can you fit that into your schedule when you're already reading books and handing out name tags and greeting everybody and whatever? So if you all go to this page, these are just three examples. Really, I am, I am a big believer in it's important for you to make this experience your own and to develop, to develop your own routine that, that feels natural between you and the kids. <coughs> but this is just three <coughs> ways that I came up with that you could actually fit in finger plays and songs and movement activities. Um, one reason to remember that it's important to do movement activities <coughs> is that there hasn't been born yet, I don't think, a child who can sit still for 30 minutes and, you know, be successful at what you're asking them to do. So if we want our kids to be successful, which is such a huge part, I think, of what we do by going in and showing up, <coughs> you know, we're building their self-esteem. We're showing them that they're worth it, that, that they matter to us, and therefore they should matter to everyone. And so we want them to feel successful at the end of our session. To do that, we, the adults in their lives, have to be smart enough to craft that 30 minutes in a way that will allow them to be successful. So we have to know what their needs are as small children and make sure that we're forming our 30 minute session in a way that allows them time to get up and move their bodies and get out any kind of, you know, wiggles or whatever that they may have without being disciplined negatively for it. So when we talk, when I talk about movement activities, it's not running races, but it could be doing the hokey pokey, okay? Or doing head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Something I've been known, I probably mentioned this before to people who have come to my other things, I've been known to have impromptu parades. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm reading a story and I can see more than two kids are doing this, that's not their problem, that's my problem, okay? I have not been attuned to their needs. So I'll say, oh, I feel like I need to stand up. Does anybody else need to stand up? And then I'll say, I'm gonna put a bookmark in the book right here, I'm gonna close it, let's have a parade. 
and they'll go, okay, and then they stand up, and then you can you basically just play follow the leader around the room. And, you know, they can be silly, and they can hop up and down, and whatever they need to do, and then you can get them back to the <coughs> room. And back on the table is a nice little rhyme that will help you get them seated, because if you get them up, you must be able to get them back down. <laughs> successful <laughs> and um, it's a cute short little rhyme that if you start using it they will learn it quickly and it's a, an easy natural way to get them back down um, so be sure to, if you don't already have it be sure to pick it up on the back table it's the one that says hands go up and hands go down anyway so don't don't feel like you have to go in and say okay I'm gonna read the first book then I'm gonna do this I'm gonna read the second book what I've learned over 25 years of working with small children is you have to be able to throw your schedule out the window because today may just be a full moon kind of day. <laughs> and no matter how much planning you put into it and how awesome this thing is, it may not work today. And that has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the atmosphere and electricity in the room and you know the phase of the moon. So um, if you see that they're getting fidgety and you're in the middle of the story, it's not the end of the world. Pay attention to that though, and say, I think we need to stand up and do something, and then get it back down and finish the story. Um, yes, no, I, and I'm not sure this is the time and place, so if not, we can move on. But what happens in my classroom, and I think in a lot of others, there are people coming in and out getting mm -hmm. kids. And, and again, this is probably a whole other discussion. Yes. No, 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 no. And yes. so you can, things can be great, but you know, someone comes in and the kids will, and, and it's so distracting. And it happens, it happens a lot. So I don't know if it's so distracting. Right well, you know, one thing I try to tell new people, if I think about it, and I often don't, but, um, you know, usually the teacher will tell you where to sit, where we do reading time or whatever, and it's on the, on the rug. I try to always tell readers, sit with your back in the corner or sit with your back to a wall as opposed to with your back near the door or in that direction because if if your back is to the door or a window or anything <coughs> where something a butterfly might float by that's all it takes you know and then having actual humans come in and stopping everything is I mean there's nothing we can do about that unfortunately so the best thing is, I think, either to, if you can, just keep moving through it, or to, if it's more than one kid that's getting, you know, a few seconds, and say, I think we'll wait until this transition is over, or something like that, and actually acknowledge to the kids, something's going on, and it's creating noise, and we're going to wait, because I really want you to be able to hear the story, okay? So, um, because life happens. And it's okay to say, well, let's wait a second until it calms down a little bit more. Yes? Uh, the other, uh, last week, one of his uh, kids' hand, he was, he had put his hand over the stove, and of course it got burned. So uh, I changed my story completely uh -huh. when we talked about safety. Mm -hmm. Not putting your hand exactly. over the stove. We talked about what you should not do and that is more careful. real life than and anything. So right. That caught the attention, no? Absolutely. You know, so even though he was the center of attention, and it was okay. Mm -hmm. But, but everybody time, makes mistakes, and mm -hmm. everybody learns from them. And so it became a, a topic for being careful not to put your hand, you know, and they were all like, and I had Thomas. Thomas was, oh, he was so happy to be with the attention. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, come up to the front, and let's. Let everybody see your cast, you know, and then to write in. And you know, you know, and that is a way, I mean, I think that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. I think how you handled that is just brilliant. Yeah. Because first of all, you that wasn't your intended lesson. No, it wasn't. But so you